introduction and uh, go into chapter one. Uh, definitely, we're not going to finish chapter one today, but it's one of our goals is to try to go um, bit by bit, but we want to go a little bit deeper in general. Uh, the book of James is one of my favorite books uh, to discuss. And so as a little uh, tip, if you need a second to go grab your, your Bibles uh, to have the book of James in front of you, that would make the, um, that would make the discussion not that we're going to have a discussion necessarily, but to have the, the text right in front of you, it would be very useful. You can underline, you can highlight, you can take notes. Um, you can have your own little study guide uh, building as we go through the book of James throughout these weeks. I don't necessarily know how many weeks it's going to take to get through it. There are five chapters in the book of James. And so I hope to have maybe... Um, it might take us the Saturdays of the Holy 50. And so we'll take it from there bit by bit. And so as a small introduction, um, the book of James, I think has been somewhat misunderstood uh, or devalued. Uh, Martin Luther called it the epistle of straw, meaning it didn't have much weight in his eyes. Maybe because he couldn't find, you know, his main teaching of justification by faith alone. And so um, some have assumed that an epistle in general uh, needs to be filled with very deep teachings, you know, like um, what is the nature of Christ, the idea of salvation, uh, wrestling with, you know, the great philosophical uh, ideas of the day, especially when you talk about and compare it to St. Paul's letters. But the epistle of St. James is a treasure and it, it's a very deep pastoral word. And I think it applies to, and we'll see how elements of it apply to our current situation, the quarantine and the lockdown and facing difficulties and challenges in our life. And so I, I hope that you're going to find the benefits of going through uh, the book of James. Who was he? Um, he refers to himself as the bond servant of God in uh, chapter one, verse one. Um, he was one of the 12 disciples. Uh, he goes by different names in scripture. Um, but we know that he was acting as, you know, first bishop in the mother church in Jerusalem. And these are accounted for in the book of Acts. You know, uh, to give you a little bit of context, since Jerusalem exercised um, a central role in coordinating uh, Christian mission, St. James and his pastoral authority extended beyond his flock in Jerusalem. And so just to give you an example or to give you more of what I'm trying to say, just as the Jewish Christians of the first century would look to Jerusalem as the mother church, they would have had in some degree look to St. James as some sort of pillar of leadership in that sense. For example, when St. Jude wrote his epistle, um, it was enough for him to refer to himself as the brother of James right, to establish his own authority. He just called himself the brother of James, and all of a sudden he had his authority to speak on behalf of what he was going to talk about. Um, we know that St. James was martyred around the year 62, and it was said that he was thrown down and clubbed to death as he preached to the people about, about our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, this letter was written around 48, uh, and he was writing to the 12 tribes that were scattered abroad. Um, this is in the first verse. And so um, we noticed that the epistle of St. James is not addressed to a specific church or a specific region. Um, it's one of the seven epistles called the Catholic epistles, right? So we have James and first and second Peter and first and second and third uh, John and Jude. And these are called the Catholic letters. Uh, they're universal letters because they're not... Um, they're not addressed or, or written towards a specific church or a specific person, uh, as in the case of St. Paul's letters. And he wrote in a time when the church was, you know, almost entirely Jewish. Um, for example, the, the gatherings of Christians were still called synagogues at that time. The word ecclesia or, or church was not uh, readily used yet. And so it's an interesting context. It's an interesting time. There, the, the line between Judaism and Christianity was not clear, and it was a little bit fuzzy. And so to the Christian Jews, 
who believed in Christ as the Messiah, they regarded themselves as good Jews, right? And as such, they would have kept all the Jewish customs. They would have had the Sabbath. They would have had the circumcision. They would have had the temple worship. They would have had the food laws, right? And so there was a division between Jew and Jew, the, the Christian Jew and the Jew who believed that Christ was a blasphemer and deceiver. Those who rejected Christ tended to persecute their Jewish brothers and sisters who did believe. And, you know, one of the most famous examples of this was St. Stephen, uh, the stoning of St. Stephen, written in the book of Acts. And so the people that James is writing to are familiar with this type of persecution, with these types of trials, right? Um, some were rich landowners, some were not. Um, and so it's interesting, the timing. Uh, if you think about it, you know, St. Paul's first missionary journey was around 47 AD. This letter was written around 48. And really around this time, the Gentile church is really starting to blossom. And so this is the context that he's writing to. There's, there's, there's division between uh, Jew and Jew. And so what was the purpose of the epistle? Why, what was he trying to get across? What message, what pastoral teachings was he trying to get across? Um, we know that there was various trials. There was persecution. There was um, injustice. There was divisions in the church. And so we know that as we read the, the book of, of James, that he was trying to encourage the Christians to endure tribulation, which they were suffering from, and to explain uh, the meaning of temptation in the light of the cross, right? To, and to remind them of what it means to, to go through temptations uh, with the suffering Lord in their forefront. And he was encouraging them to be steadfast in their faith. And not only that, but to have a practical faith, to live out their faith practically. And he wanted to clarify the concept of living faith and its correlation to our works, right? Um, it said that faith must work. Faith must produce, right? Faith, it must be visible. And so he wanted to, to clarify this concept of a living faith. Um, and he also wanted to reveal some of the dangers of particular sins that many had thought were trivial. And so he wanted to highlight those, those specific points. The biggest theme is faith and works. Um, a lot of the people during this time were plagued with a sin of hypocrisy. Uh, there was a split between uh, profession and practice, what they were preaching and what they actually did, walking the walk and talking the talk. Um, and so there was a, there's a, a split between faith and work. And, and it started to manifest itself in distrust and dissension and fights. Um, the people faced temptation not to live out their faith in Christ, but instead they wanted to fall back onto worldly ways, right? Pursuing wealth, pursuing, uh, fighting their brethren, judging and, and reproaching the poor. Many wanted worldly success. They wanted to become teachers. They wanted to become elders in the community to further their own ambitions. Some of the so uh, poor, they suffered and they, they suffered hardships at the hands of the rich landowners. And so this epistle, the main theme is the faith and works, and it, and it offers uh, pastoral words of rebuke as well as encouragement. And he insists that the true Christian faith is actualized in work. Uh, foremost, he would argue, is the control of the tongue. And we'll go into that more in more details. What I love about this book of James is that it's very practical. It has a, it has a very deep but very practical style of holiness and Christian life. Um, it's clear, it's concise, uh, it's easy to understand. It's strict in its rebuke, but it's also uh, very rich in its love and its compassion. And so this is how the different um, chapters are broken down with the different themes of each chapter, um, faith and temptations, faith and works, and so on. Uh, and so this is not necessarily a guide of how I'm gonna break down the different talks, but just kind of how the, the different chapters of the book were um, kind of organized. There's only five chapters. So as we read uh, and we study the book of James together, I would highly encourage that you take this time during the Holy 50 to read the book of James several times through, um, underline, um, memorize certain verses from the book of James to really apply it so that we can, we can live our faith. We don't have to just 
um, memorize verses for the sake of memorizing verses, but to actually live our faith. And so that was my short introduction. And I wanted to get into uh, some of the elements of chapter one. And so chapter one can be titled uh, Faith and Temptations. And we're going to go verse by verse, and we might take longer in certain places, and I might group up verses in certain ways, but we'll see how far we can get in chapter one today without going uh, too overboard with the time. Uh, and I want to be, I, 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 I heavily believe in a short, concise message versus um, something that's too, too long, especially on a Zoom call. Um, so this is how chapter one is organized. Um, he goes into a greeting. Um, there's, he talks directly about outward temptations. He goes into inward temptations and he talks about our role as children of God, listening and doing, being swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath and things like this. And so we'll, we'll go for it uh, bit by bit. But I would like to take a moment for us to read chapter one. I'm gonna read it out loud and hopefully you have your Bibles in front of you and uh, you're able to follow along with me, okay? So we'll start in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In one God, amen. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be found perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with, it, with a burning heat that it withers as the grass. The flower fa falls and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved he will receive the crown of life which the lord has promised to those who love him let no one say when he is tempted i am tempted by god for god cannot be tempted by evil nor does he himself tempt anyone but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed then when desire has conceived it gives birth to sin and sin when it is full grown brings forth death do not be deceived, my brother, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that, he, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive the meekness and planted word, which is able to save your souls, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but, dece but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God is this, to visit orphans and the widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. And glory be to God forever. Amen. And so what I'd like to do with the time that we have is to, is to look at this verse by verse. And notice in, in verse one, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, the 12 tribes in dispersion, greetings. St. James, he does not mention that he was related to the Lord, right, in the flesh, but he calls himself a servant. He doesn't refer to himself as a kinsman. He refers to himself as a bondservant. We know that a slave or a servant 
did not have any rights or authority over his own body or his will or his wife or his children, but his master has the right to manage all of his affairs according to the master's wishes. And so St. James, he loves the Lord Jesus Christ to the extent of considering himself a slave to him. He rejoices to let um, our Lord Jesus Christ do whatever he likes with him. And this is uh, slavery, but not against his will, but in love and submission. Um, this saying of call, referring to himself as a servant of God, it reveals um, the greatness of St. James and his love for Christ and his, his true humility that he has towards God, a slave of God. You know, it's a title of honor. Um, it established himself as one who waits on God with all closeness as a slave to his master. He could have referred to himself as the brother of James, right? Or blood, the brother of Christ. We know that he's the kinsman. He's, um, he could have exalted himself uh, and, and really focused on his blood relation. Um, but in his mind, these ties of, of kinship is irrelevant. And so he boasts in, in his boast is not that he was our Lord's kinsman, um, but that he remains his, his true slave. And he says to the 12 tribes, and what's meant by this, um, he's referring to all believers in Christ. This is why it's referred to as a Catholic epistle. Um, by saying 12 tribes, it's a way of indicating the totality to all believers in Christ, right? Um, so we can assume that James intends that his letter has the widest distribution as possible. And it's not just simply for his own flock in Jerusalem, but for all Christians throughout the world, wherever they may be. Uh, in, in verse two, he says, count it all joy, my brethren, when he fall into various trials. You know, as if he's telling them, when trials befall you, not only one trial, but many trials, when they befall you, it's appropriate for you not only to rejoice, but to have all joy. It's a, it's a heavy saying. Notice he didn't say, oh, by the way, he didn't say my children, like St. John in his letters, but he says my brethren. And I think, you know, the reason why he refers to them as my brethren is he's talking about temptations. He's talking about suffering. So he wants to stir in them courage as brothers in Christ so that they're no longer little children in Christ. They're no longer babes in Christ. And it's an important word in this epistle. In fact, James uses the word brethren or brother, this affectionate term, around 15 times in the entire epistle. And it shows that he addresses the people not as some exalted judge that presides over them, no, but as a fellow believer. It is, it's such humility that he calls them brethren. He, and he wants to appeal to them to submit to the same teachings that he himself would submit to. And so by saying my brethren, he reminds them of their fellowship together and the spiritual brotherhood uh, that they have in their new birth in Christ. And it makes them accept the sufferings without grumbling, but in complete submission and counting it all joy. Um, when, you know, the Greek word for fall in this, in this verse it does not mean entering into temptations, but it means that temptations surround us from the outside. And so it also implies that these temptations happen suddenly and unexpectedly. And so what St. James, what, what he's, he's not addressing the temptations that stem from the inside, but he's talking about the ones from the outside. And so when he talks about the various trials, He's speaking to those, um, the word used in Greek here for the trial of suffering, it, it's, it's so severe that it could cause one to fall away from their faith. And it was from this experience of testing that Christ urges his disciples in Gethsemane. He, he, he urges them with these types of trials to, to pray with him that God would deliver them being, uh, and, and being uh, safely through them. And so St. James uses the same word here to describe the various and many ways in which the Christian Jews are being persecuted by their non-Christian neighbors. 
and they may be tempted to despair and to conclude that God has abandoned them. And so, again, he wants to, to focus on this part. He's saying in verse 3, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. The testing of your faith produces patience. And so the source of rejoicing in trials is that the believer considers them as a test of his faith. And so to kind of summarize where we're at so far in the first three verses, St. James says that persecutions are not a catastrophe. Now he's saying that and he wants his readers to understand that they should count it all joy and nothing but joy whenever they suffer for their faith, knowing that the proving of their faith in the furnace of life, the furnace of persecution, it works perseverance and steadfastness in their hearts. And notice that the patience here does not imply, you know, a negative aspect where one submits uh, to the suffering of suppression, but it leads where, where this kind of negative, um, this negative aspect where if you uh, submit to the sufferings, it can make someone want to explode. No, it implies a positive aspect, that patience, the, the patience that you're producing is full of love, where one can cast all their sufferings on the suffering Lord with joy and love and submission. And he says, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete and lacking nothing. There was a quote from St. John Chrysostom, which I, I, I really like here. He says, um, he compared us to the baby who is learning to walk. A mother holds his hand and then lets go to see if he can walk by himself. And he may fall and cry, but her heart and her eyes and all her feelings are with him. In the same manner, God holds our hand and is very compassionate towards us. But sometimes he has to withdraw his hand without forsaking us. He allows that we go through trials to train us to reach spiritual manhood. The trials that we face sometimes in our Christian lives, they're bitter and they're hard and they're difficult. And in themselves, they, they can be the most difficult challenges that we can ever face. But the patience that they produce, it has a perfect purpose, Right? And it says in verse four, that you may be perfect and complete and lacking nothing, you know, that you may be perfect, that you may be spiritually mature, you know, to plant a tree. It is not enough to plant the seed and water it, but we have to protect it from the wind um, and then expose it little by little so that it can get stronger and stronger in the same manner. It's not enough that we believe in Christ, but after we are born in baptism, we have to share in his sufferings until the new man grows in within us and, and we are matured in our spiritual manhood, right? And, it, and we're, we're called to be complete and lacking nothing. And, you know, this means not only to be perfect, but this maturity includes all aspects of spiritual life. Uh, the Greek word here means um, the whole entire, uh, not fractured by divided loyalties, right? So we shouldn't find ways of compromising our faith in Christ to avoid suffering, but instead let perseverance have its perfect work that, and let the experience of enduring persecution do its job of purifying the heart, and then the believer will be perfect and intact. And so St. James is saying that enduring persecution with joy results finally in having a united heart, one that's zealously set on serving God so that one is lacking nothing that one needs. And I think I'm going to, to kind of finish up in verse five for today, just to get us started. Uh, I don't want to go like too far beyond a half an hour. Um, I think that's, a kind of a good place. So we'll stop at verse five. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. So the question is, how do we endure temptation? How do we endure temptation? First, we look at verse five. Verse five gives us one of the first answers by obtaining the heavenly wisdom. And so through heavenly wisdom, 
one can realize God's will and his purpose to those who endure patiently to the end. So he rejoices over the temptations as if finding, um, as if finding prey. Uh, some may think that they lack wisdom, and so you know they don't know how to respond to persecution. So what should we, they say when they are challenged about their faith? How should they respond uh, about you know when they're insulted or dragged into a situation where they don't have the words to to communicate? They need only to ask from God. And it's a promise. It's it's a very clear promise in verse five that such wisdom will be given. It needs to be asked in faith, but it will be given. And uh, God is not stingy with his gifts, you know? He is the one to give to all men generously, liberally, spontaneously, openly, um, and the one who will give without reproaching his children for their poverty and their mistakes. It's not because of our shortcomings, but when we have faith and when we pray openly and we, and we are in all humility, we, we know that we lack the wisdom, but we ask of God and we pray earnestly. You know, it's a very clear promise that our Lord, he gives to all men liberally, without reproach, without holding back. You know, there's no strings attached. If we ask God with all faith, um, he will give to all of us the wisdom that you need to respond in each situation. And so I wanted to end here and we'll continue here to asking in faith without doubting. Um, and it's interesting, tomorrow we, we talk about Thomas Sunday, you know, and we talk about doubt. And so, you know, we'll continue this conversation about uh, asking with faith and without doubting. Um, but we'll continue next week. Uh, we hit about the half an hour mark, and I think that's, that's a good place to be.